Psalm 68 and verse 5. We're going to read from verses 5. Uh, let's just read to verse 10, even though my emphasis is in verse 5 and 6. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Um, the context of this psalm is it's a song of deliverance and a song of praise. A song of deliverance in the sense that David in this psalm is trying to sing the songs of God as relates to God bringing out the children of Israel from Egypt. It's also a song of praise because in God's manifestations in delivering his people from Egypt, he expressed his divine power, his glory, his grace, and his mercy. So it's on that backdrop that David is singing this song. He says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. And God doesn't need to father the fatherless and defend the widows by physically being present. He says out of his divine location, which is his holy habitation, he has capacity to stretch forth his arm and father the fatherless and defend the widow. Next verse. He says God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound unto prosperity but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. If you now combine these two verses, you will find out that there are specific characteristics of people that are described as David seeks to magnify the name of God. First of all, he speaks about the fatherless. Second, he speaks about the widow. Next, he speaks about the solitary. If you read it in certain translations, certain translations call the person the orphan. In certain translations, the solitary is called the one who is lonely. So you have the fatherless, you have the widow, you have the orphan, the lonely, the one who is alone. Then you have the prisoner. New King James says, those who are bound those who are in chains. A certain translation calls them the prisoner. And then finally, the last class of people that are identified here are called what? The rebellious. So each of these, if you've been here long enough, I've taught you that they are symptoms or they are um, portraits of what I like to call counterfeit Christianity or the false presentation of the relationship with God. And if you look at all these characteristics here, first of all, you have the fatherless, you have the widow, you have the orphan, you have the prisoner, and then you have the rebellious. Each of these people that are identified in this scripture are not necessarily people who do not know God. But what has happened here is they are contact or their connection with God has not translated to anything rich or deep such that they've not been able to maximize that experience so the condition in which they met God has still not changed. Now if you listen to that my teaching on the portraits of the false Christian you know that I speak of the widow for instance who is the widow? The widow is in natural terms the one whose husband has departed. Is that true? A woman is not a widow if her husband is still alive. A widow is different from a divorcee. A divorcee still has hope that the potential or the possibility of reconciliation with her husband still exists. Even though the man has said, I don't want to do again, or the woman has said she doesn't want to do again, the partner still exists and is still alive. But for the widow, 
there is no possibility that the husband will ever return. Why? The husband has departed. In this sense, the departure is not a departure to another wife or another house. The departure is a departure to the place of death, the place of no return. So in spiritual terms, a widow is one whom the Lord has what? Departed. And most of the time when you read scriptures and the Bible begins to speak about people who have become apostate. Have you read that the Bible says it is difficult to restore? Have you read that scripture before? Those who have tasted of the powers of the age to come. It's difficult. What has happened to those people is that they have degenerated to a state of apostasy and their condition in the spirit is the one of a what? A widow. So this is why the Bible says that he is able to bring deliverance even to a widow. With men it might be impossible, but with God, God has capacity to reach even into the farthest places to restore those whom even society has labeled as lost. So everyone needs to find out where their relationship falls into in the context of their dealings with God. Why am I starting here? Because as I tried to pray, in fact, I found it very difficult to pray today. Most of what I did today, my, my closet was just to cry to the Lord. I don't know why. And I sense that, I don't, I don't know, but let me keep teaching. I will touch it shortly. I sense that there are people in this place that what God wants to do for you today is that he wants to give you hope. He wants to restore your hope. It, it feels in my spirit like there are some of you who feel as if you have been abandoned and there is nobody who is on your case. Nobody even cares whether you exist. But God is going to whisper to you tonight. Amen. He will whisper. So when you read scriptures, you will find that even from the beginning of, of dealings that God had with man, God began to introduce the contexts of relationship. I'm going to come back here. This is where I'm going to finish. God began to introduce the context of relationship. In fact, if you're a Bible student, one who is given to careful Bible study, you will find out that there are two sacred relationships that God introduces in Genesis. I call them sacred because one is reference. The other is a metaphor for that reference. And everything that God does, even throughout scripture, revolves around these two relationships. So the first relationship you see introduced in scripture is the relationship between God and man. The relationship between who? God and man. So God shows us that he created Adam and the reason he created Adam was because he wanted Adam to be a representative of him upon the face of the earth. So even in Luke's genealogy, Adam is called the son of God. Adam is called the son of God because that's the first relationship that God introduces, man and God. And you see, if you do not get this important relationship right, you will be around Christian circles and you will think that you are making progress with God and you will never be able to come to the place where you understand why you are really a Christian in the first place. The center, the focus of the Christian life must go back to the original sacred relationship that God created in Genesis. And that is, the focus of the Christian life must be to deepen that relationship with God. Everything that God did with Adam, the whole idea of putting Adam in the Garden of Eden, the whole idea, idea of having conversations regularly with Adam, the whole idea of putting Adam in charge of the work of his hands was so that on a daily basis, Adam will grow in his knowledge of who God is. Everything that was happening in the Garden of Eden between man and God was to emphasize the need for intimacy between man and God. All that God wanted from Adam in the Garden of Eden was for Adam to 
build a solid relationship with him. Adam was supposed to grow on a daily basis to become one with God in such a level that intimacy would be a natural outflow of his life. In fact, God's original intention was as Adam grows in that knowledge and has come to a certain point, then he will eat of the tree of knowledge, of life. But at the end, what Adam chose was to go and eat of the tree of good and evil. God's original design was that Adam will grow in that relationship and become intimate with him. This is supposed to be the focus of the Christian life. Please stay with me tonight. I just want to follow the Holy Spirit. This is supposed to be the center of existence for the believer. Every other thing is supposed to be secondary. And you see, when you see things of, unfold in natural life, it exposes Christianity in our day. It shows us that there is a big, big flaw in the kind of Christianity that we are building. When things happen, maybe public things happen, and you see the response of believers, you now know that the average Christian does not even understand what the essence of the Christian life is supposed to be. So somebody who mirrors a kind of life that does not mirror the character and the nature of God is doing something that seems to be success in the eyes of the world, pastors are going there to take selfie. Christians are gathering there to sing praise and worship songs. Because anything that looks as if mortal man is progressing, Christians are gathering there. You know why we are bored in church? Our Christianity is not providing us enough satisfaction. And the reason is because we are pursuing the wrong thing. Man was designed to find intimacy. If he doesn't find it, he will keep feeling dissatisfied. And you know the consequence of that dissatisfaction is he will be looking for the mundane to feel the hunger that he is suffering. So pastors are using someone who dresses half naked. In fact, I saw a picture where this said person was on a flight and all her, 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 her underwear was in public glare. The picture is taken in such a way that um, you cannot but see that she's half naked. Oh, you see, pastors gathered there. And you saw, I saw a popular pastor in one of these our cities. I know that the bloggers will not give, will not give me peace, but I'll not send them. In one of our popular cities, went there and cropped a picture of her and put a worship song on top. To tell us that what we are seeing is a product of the spirit that is resting. I'm telling you that the problem is we do not know what to do with our relationship with God. So the average Christian cannot deepen his work with God. So he looks for the peripheral, the, the useless, the mundane. To try to fill in the gap. Even Satan laughs at us in this generation. We don't know the essence of our engagements with Jesus. We do not understand that the craving in the heart of God is that you will deepen your work with him. This is what God was introducing in Genesis. He wanted man, Proximus. He wanted man in a place where he could reach out to man and fellowship. It's not that God was lacking anything. But what he was, he was reflecting was the heart of a father who wanted intimate relations with his children. But you see, what we have with God is a relationship whereby all we need God for is for him to give us something. We don't want him to give us himself. If God is going to give himself to a man, there's a price to pay for it. Hey, dear brother, if God wants to give you himself, the price for intimacy is total stripping. God will make you naked. He will take everything from you and bring you to the place that you have nothing 
and all you have is him and he is enough